welcome to a very special edition of the Piano Men with Stanley Carr. We've got a very special guest with me tonight. He is a pianist and songwriter, recorded with a lot of artists such as Billy Preston, Patti LaBelle, Jennifer Holliday, Lisa Simone, just to name a few. And uh, he's going to share with us his story. I'm pleased to welcome Michael Waters to the show. Michael, welcome to the Piano Men. Hey, Stanley. Thank you for having me. Yes, it's my pleasure. Well, where are you from? Tell me about your upbringing in childhood. Well, originally I am from Amsterdam in the Netherlands and um, grew up there as a kid in the candy store back then. <laughs> Things were kind of crazy in Amsterdam and the rest of the world looked at us with like, oh my God, that's the place to be. And um, by now, um, like you can get that stuff anywhere. We know what we're talking about. Like, Don't do drugs. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so I grew up uh, pretty uh, free and liberal in a, in a very free society. And um, I, I was born in 1970, so now you know how old I am. And uh, so I lived through the 70s and the 80s, and those were, for me at least, good years of music. Um, so a, a good time and place to be. Yeah, I mean, definitely a lot of artists came out around that time. That was like that singer-songwriter period, like Elton John, Billy Joel, Carly Simon, James Taylor. Oh, man, I could be here all day just listening names. But yeah, definitely like very, you could feel the music too. It was like emotion, raw, and just incredible storytelling. Yeah, absolutely. And and those were the days of the big studios and uh and the budgets and, you know, artists exploding and, uh, and and the real pop stars that we don't really have anymore, I guess. And uh, yeah, that's. Um, yeah, definitely. All right. So when you first, how did you get into music? First of all, was that just something that you just did on your own or your, did you come from a musical family? Tell me about that. Well, my dad had a piano at home when he grew up and, um, Every time he would play, like people would shout at him, like that's the wrong note. So, by the time he was old enough um, to to buy his own instrument, he figured, let me buy an electronic organ so I can use a headphone, and people can't nag when I play something wrong. So, um, having an electronic organ in the house basically led me to play um, electronic organ. So I started taking lessons. I guess when I was five, I started doing like music theory in elementary school. And I absolutely hated that because that was always on the Wednesday afternoon. And like in the Netherlands, we would go to school. School ended on Wednesday at 12 o'clock. Mm. And so I would have to come back at 3.30 for my music lesson to learn xylophone and learn notes and rhythm and theory. And I hated it because all my buddies would go to the swimming pool or they would play outside. And I would always have to go back to school at 3.30. Yeah. So I kind of sort of plowed through that and um, playing the xylophone wasn't really all that um, uh, exciting. It was actually, actually it was a glockenspiel. It was even worse. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> just, just to learn the notes, you know, and like, and, and rhythm and try to pling together with the teacher. And uh, so I started uh, getting into organ lessons and that I really loved. So I played probably organ from five to 12. And uh, for my fifth to my 12th year and uh, at a local school, local music school. And those were kind of show tunes like American, like standards and, and everything that was written for electronic organ. I basically played in those days. Like Gershwin type stuff and then leading into the 60s right. and 70s musicals like Rodgers and Hammerstein all that stuff, yeah. yeah, and it was all written out for like organ chords. So the the right hand would play the melody, the left hand would play the chords, and then the foot uh, would play the bass notes. And then uh, if I was lucky, I was I, I could turn on the rhythm, <laughs> the rhythm box on the organ. Okay. Sound a bit like Napoleon Dynamite, you know, the score of Napoleon Dynamite. Yeah, 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 yeah. Funky yeah. drum beats. <laughs> mm -hmm. That was the electronic organ. <laughs> wow. Okay. And uh, go on. Sorry. Yeah, it definitely seems like you got like a really unique education as far as music goes. I mean, you, you yeah, really. The, it was it was very uh, yeah, it, it was very European unique, I guess. Yeah. Um, and uh, so my, my parents were musical. But my parents both sang in the church choir 
where they would sing uh, uh, like classical masses, you know, the church organ. We had a massive church organ and I was allowed to sit next to the organ player to flip the pages and, and like flip all the, the registers on this big church organ. And from time to time, he would let me play on a church organ, which is a, an experience on its own to yeah, like this massive organ through a church. So it was really cool. Nice. And uh, yeah, so my, my upbringing was like kind of show tunes and weird music that I played on an organ and then combined with my parents' classical choir stuff. So all those notes would basically go through my mind at home as a kid. Were you more a show tune kind of guy or a classical kind of guy? Well, I was. it was sort of like pop pop show tune stuff, you know, the, an occasional Beatles song or whatever, and a wider shade of pale, those kind of like yeah. organ arrangements Purple that they made for, for that. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so I was, I was very, my, my dad used to listen to Mahalia Jackson and Big Bill Brunsey, like, and, you know, like uh, gospel and, and blues and, and black artists. Um, so my whole, yeah, it was very eclectic. The, the radio in the Netherlands is always very eclectic. They, they don't, have like specific stations, just a rock station or just a blues station. Mm -hmm. Like they would play like all kinds of music um, More throughout the day. Yeah, it's very diverse. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. Do you remember the first kind of you? I'm sure like you grew up with cassette tapes and vinyls and LPs. Do you remember some of the some of the first of those that you bought or? Asked for yeah, it? absolutely. Yeah, so so um, I had a record player. I, I think I got that when I was like ten or something. You know, for Christmas I got a record player, and I think the first couple of albums I got were like the the, the five dollar Elvis Presley albums from the discount store, that kind of stuff. Um, I got the the first single uh, like from the Grease album, like uh, um, some of that stuff. It was very again very eclectic. The movie Grease just came out. Um, the television series Fame was on at the time, mm -hmm. yep. so that was like a big inspiration for me. I wanted to be Bruno Martelli. Like, really? I, I was just fascinated by, yeah, I was like, I really wanted to go to a music school, and I was hoping that everybody would be like dancing in the in the hallways, and the band would be jamming, and and all that good stuff. And yeah, yeah, definitely had that energy, and and it was very vibrant. You could tell by that by that show. Yeah, and I really figured, I really saw myself like becoming famous or like a songwriter. And, and because Bruno Mortelli was also a composer, so that whole aspect was already like uh, awakened in me to sort of like, oh, you got to write and play and then and then you get the girl and like all that stuff. Like I think yeah. like that's, that's going to be my life. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's not a bad dream to shoot for really, honestly. Right. So what period did you say i gotta do this professionally i want to start being a musician well i guess like after i think when i was about 12 or something i i had an organ teacher and he was like well i want you to apply for conservatory so let's work towards that by the time you're like 16 17 you you should apply for that like the, the it's sort of like you could do that after or next to high school you could already start with that music education and at the time, I didn't see myself play organ anymore because I thought it was kind of a dorky instrument at the time. I hadn't really discovered the Hammond organ yet. So I was sort of like, well, I want a keyboard and probably play in a band. So when I was 12, I um, auditioned for a local band and um, started playing with like some musicians. They were like 16, 17, 18. And we did some local gigs. And I was like, literally, I was 12. I had no clue what I was doing. My dad had to drive me to the gigs and make sure I didn't do drugs or get drunk or whatever. <laughs> and uh, it was just a fun time. And so during high school, I played in a couple of uh, high school bands. And when I was about 16, 17, and I saw all my friends sort of slowly preparing to become, um, um, to, to go study economics or something, to become an accountant or a lawyer, I thought to myself like that, I'm going to die if I have to do that. I got to do something else. So I figured like the conservatory thing wasn't such a bad idea after all. And I figured, so let me try out for piano. But I had never really played piano before because I always played keyboard in a band and I played organ before that. 
Um, so I knew uh, that you had to have a certain affinity with jazz music. That was basically what they wanted. Um, and I had to have like a little bit of solfege and know a little bit about rhythm. Um, so when I was 18, I had just graduated high school. I auditioned for a conservatory. And we had two really good conservatories in the Netherlands. One was in a uh, town called Utrecht. And the other one was in Hilversum. And in Hilversum was basically the mecca for jazz, like musicians from all over Europe would study at Hilversum um, at that conservatory. And I auditioned there. And I remember I was practicing in the hallway and I was practicing um, Scrapple from the Apple because I had played that as an organ tune, just like the, the standard. And I played it sort of as a, almost as a ballad, like ba da ba da ba da ba da it's sort of like a swing tune. And then I heard in another hallway, I heard another piano player play it as <laughs> the bebop tune it was supposed to be. It was like, I'm never going to make this. What am I doing here? <laughs> so I auditioned and they basically, they literally laughed at me. It was almost like the Simon Cromwell version of like, what the hell are you doing here? I want to know the name of your teacher. I want to call him and tell him to never send any students to us anymore. <laughs> it was really... It was really, really rough. Wow. And, uh, and then I auditioned in the other city in Utrecht. And there they heard some potential in me, but they were like, well, you're, you're too green. You know, like just go study for a year, find a good piano teacher, and then come back and then we'll see you again. So then I was like 18. So from 18 to 19, I found a really great piano player uh, who was a big fan of Bill Evans. And so that was my first... Um, kind of reconnaissance of jazz music and of Bill Evans and of like piano playing, uh, jazz piano playing, which is a whole different style from playing organ where you have one hand playing a chord and the other one the melody. And now just sort of break up the chords and the melody and the harmonization with two hands. Um, so I started studying that for a year and then went back to that same school where they were friendly. <laughs> and I auditioned again and then I got submitted there or admitted there, and I studied there for about five years. Oh, okay. Yeah, definitely seems like you learned a lot, you know, as you started making your way into the into the schools and really getting that education that, that was needed. Yeah, and it's, and it's really weird because I, I don't know what it's like here in America, but in the Netherlands, there is not really a music culture where your parents would advise you to, why don't you play an instrument and become a composer or become a musician? Because there's good money to be made. Where I came from, that was sort of like the choice not to do. Like everybody would advise against that. Um, which is like, and, and especially I've, I've lived in LA for a bit and everybody I met there were like families with children. Everybody was sort of like stimulated to like, go do music. There's like, there's work, <laughs> you know, there's money to be made. And, and I did not come from that background at all. So it was a really weird choice and uh, journey. It definitely changed in culture for sure. I mean, America's got, a, you know, so many different opportunities for musicians. Uh, but it's also pretty interesting to hear people from other parts of the world, how they got their start. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's there's definitely some differences you know you can tell you know somebody coming to the country for the first time you know noticing that right right yeah like i i've noticed and especially in uh, i've lived in la for about six years and i met so many people that had like like very professional studios in their house because like whatever they bought the house from a famous musician or the their dad was a famous this or that or toured with whatever band like there was such a culture of music and and the business side of music to actually make a good living off music and um so to make that choice to study music has always been very strange for me but at the same time very liberating to to not really be part of society as like oh i gotta get up at nine or get up at eight to work from nine to five and just have sort of this weird lifestyle that brought me all over the place yeah Definitely been all over, definitely been to so many places around the world. What can you tell me about the music culture in the Netherlands? Do you feel like it's different from the culture here? Uh, yeah, I, I do think so. I mean, there's a lot of talent in, in the Netherlands and in Europe in general. I've, I've met a lot of very talented musicians and everybody studies 
very hard and uh, we have some amazing um, yeah there's, a, there's an amazing music culture but the ceiling is it's a very it's very easily reached like you can only get so far because it's a small country mm-hmm. uh, or every country has its own little uh, niches and it's very hard to break out of that and do something that is international uh, when you go to the UK, the UK is a very good breeding ground for international artists mm-hmm. and the United States, for sure. That's like the Mecca to go to. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Europe is very, it's very tiny. It's very hard to break out of. And it's also hard when you tell people you want to get out of there. Um, the culture of like, well, why don't you, you shouldn't go. You'll never make it. It's too far, uh, too far reached. Why don't you just stay here and be happy in your own country kind of thing yeah i mean definitely you know it it is tough but you know you've made it i mean you're still you know still going strong and throughout the show we're going to be playing some of your music and talking more about you know the work that you've done our first selection tonight is a song called daddy's caddy tell me about that song how was that recorded and how did that come about Right. Um, yeah. So at the time I had a studio in Amsterdam with a business partner, Roni Morgan, and we got in touch with Billy Preston in L.A. We went to L.A. We visited him in his house, uh, jammed a little bit there with him on his piano. And uh, Billy Preston was like a phenomenal musician, very humble, very talented man. I think very underrated, actually, for um what he has accomplished in his life Mm -hmm. and um for sure yeah and and so we stayed in touch with him and every time he would visit the netherlands um he toured with clapton at some point and during his tour he would stop by our studio and at some point we found ourselves like late at night jamming he was sitting at our fender road and he was playing some chords and we were like well that sounds kind of cool and and my buddy uh roni was basically telling him like well billy i don't really feel this just yet and i was like dude you can't say that to billy preston and uh and billy was like okay i'll play something else and he started playing like the jam of the chords of that song and um later um i wrote the lyrics to it and we sort of had a theme we worked with an artist at the time and we kind of imagined him to be Billy Preston's son. Like that was sort of the theme of the song where uh, Billy as an older man, uh, he used to have a, ha, uh, used to have a Cadillac and uh, aptly named Daddy's Caddy, but he would have to sell it to take care of his family. And now the son was like uh, searching for that same Cadillac, that type to bring it back to his dad to kind of give him that last ride in the, in the heydays of his life, basically. Yeah. So that was the theme of the song. And we made it a little Southern, like with the mouth harp in there and uh, played some Hammond on it. And we kind of finished that song in the period where, uh, and it was kind of a sad moment. Billy um, got, uh, he had a kidney failure and he needed dialysis every other day or so. And at some point we got a phone call from his manager at the time, Joyce Moore, um, telling us that Billy was in the hospital and um, and we played the song over the phone for him. And he was very weak at the time. And she said, like, oh, he loved the song. And a couple of days later, he went into a coma and he never came out of that. And uh, so unfortunately, we never got to actually play this for him live or in person or, or even, you know, go on the road with him or whatever. We were uh, at the time about to sign with Billy's uh, uh, publishing company. Uh, to start writing for him and working with him. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, that fizzled out there. But still very, it was a beautiful moment to write that song with him and uh, and to have that memory. Definitely bittersweet for sure. Such a shame uh, that he never got to hear it uh, for perfor- being performed. But um, that will be a testament to his legacy, being able to, being able to write a song with you. One of the last pieces of work that he was able to do but we're gonna play it right here daddy's caddy on the piano men and we're back on the piano men talking with pianist and musician michael waters on the show tonight about his career in the music business michael you had mentioned earlier you went to a variety of different conservatories to study music tell me about any pieces of advice that you got while you were there from your professors that you kind of took away that still stick with you um, to this well, day. yeah, 
Um, so one of my teachers, my main teacher, uh, his name was Bert van der Brink. Um, he was born blind and um, he was a phenomenal, he still is, he's still alive. He played with Didi Bridgewater and um, he toured even as a, as a blind pianist. And uh, one of the things he always told me is like, just don't make any excuses. Like there's always someone around the corner that is ready and willing to take your place. So always just do your best, study as hard as you can and show up on time and mainly be a very nice guy because there are so many talented people out there that are absolute a-holes that, you know, they can play really great and they can be the star, but no one is ever going to call them to do a session or to work with because if you're not a nice dude, forget about it. So those were some very important words for me to like always be humble, be on time. Um, just study what you can study and give it your all. Yeah, that's very well put too. When you first broke out into the music business, music scene uh, in Europe, uh, tell me about any memories that you can recall about your first few gigs. All right. So I, um, as soon as I, uh, when I studied music, I played in a lot of local uh, bands like jazz gigs, weddings, um, uh, corporate parties, all that stuff. Uh, it paid the bills and it was it's a lot of fun to do that but at the same time you also realize that's not um it, it's not where the stardom is or where my uh, where i felt my future was and uh, you can make a very good living playing in a in a good band whether it's a cover band or um playing your originals there's a very good market for that um but i always felt i wanted to do something else i wanted to write and produce um, so my path was more into at some point building a studio or working at a studio and somehow start writing songs. And, uh, I kind of grew into that. I, at some point had a, a piano student who became my business partner later, who, uh, convinced me that we needed a studio and that we needed to work together and that we needed to just write music. And, um, two years down the road, we had found a sponsor and we had found some some business people that kind of wanted to invest but then pulled out again but we were already like stepping forward and we were already getting into um building a studio and there was no way back and from that moment on i felt like every step you take it just will lead you to the next thing in life and and before we knew it we had like a professional studio and we started just working with artists and recording and and writing songs and it kind of naturally grew into that there was no one telling me i couldn't do it so i figured well somebody's got to do it and that somebody's going to be me it definitely seems less stressful too once you're in control of it i mean once it's in your hands you don't have to worry about like answering to anybody absolutely yeah we we definitely our our vision and especially and i i feel the same my vision has always been as long as i can just sit behind a piano and write a song and if nobody understands what I'm doing, then I'll record it. And if nobody understands what that song needs to sound like, then I'll start producing it until I feel like this is the finished product. And then I can play it for people. And if they want to record my song, great, go ahead. And if nobody wants to do it, then I'll just, nowadays you can just release your own stuff. So I started releasing my own stuff on, on Spotify as well. And I'm like, now I don't need anybody anymore which is kind of lonely in a way, but at the same time, it's like I, whatever I do, I can produce it. I can work from the start from the, the very beginning of the ID to the finished product and just let it go and hatch another egg. Who have been some of the people that have come to use your studio over the years? Um, in the Netherlands, I've worked with uh, some local artists, one artist that, um, uh, you heard on on Daddy's Caddy was his name was Brown Hill, it was a local uh, kit at the time that we worked with. Um, we worked with um, over there um, uh, the Two Unlimited, uh, the singer, the female singer from Two Unlimited, Anita Dot. Uh, like so, all of the things that we did and we worked on um, never really got the big record. We never hit the the, the top. 40, 50, the billboard charts with massive hits. Um, so for me, that always feels a little double. I'm like, well, 
success is only success if it's like if it's really out there and at the same time all the things that i've done in my life feel like they're all small successes because i'm still doing it and i'm and i work with all these people and so yeah like billy preston came along at some point uh, we met nona hendrix and nona hendrix at the time uh, had the idea of putting the group labelle back together to do a reunion album with the group labelle with patty labelle and sarah dash and um, this was right after I wrote the song called Dear Rosa, um, which was a tribute to Rosa Parks. And she heard the song in the studio and then decided, well, this is the first song I'm going to send to Patti LaBelle. This is a song I want to record with her. And this is going to put the band back together, so to speak. Okay. Um, she did want to do a, a, a rewrite on it, which... Bumped me out a little bit because the song I felt like was so channeled and so sort of a gift from the higher powers that nobody should have touched that as it was mm. kind of perfect. You know, if, <laughs> whatever you believe in, if God gives you a song, then like, don't touch it. That's what it's supposed to be. Um, but they made a rewrite and recorded that song. And I'm still very proud of the fact that like I can say, hey, Betty LaBelle wrote, uh, recorded one of my songs. It's an amazing moment. It's a big deal. Um, yeah, it was it's a very proud moment. And uh, I had sent the song to Rosa Parks when she was still alive. And she wrote me a letter back to thank me for that song. And to me, that was sort of my my personal little Grammy. You know, just that letter coming from Rosa Parks. I was like, yeah, I, I don't need a Grammy anymore. This is perfect. Yeah, I mean, one of the most important figures in American history. That was yeah, just... Yeah. Yeah, that's just so cool that you're able to receive that from her. Yeah, I'm I'm that was a very proud moment. Do you have any like dream collaborators or people or artists that you'd like to just work with one day like behind the studio? Well, I I guess most of the artists that I would have loved to work with um were uh, people that are no longer with us. Um one was Luther Vandross that would have been an artist like to just hear your song being performed by someone of that caliber knowing that whatever you write like even if it's a very simple three chord song but like with the right words of course to hear someone of that caliber caliber sing your song that that was always my dream i back in the days i would have loved to work with whitney houston or mariah carey or christina aguilera like the the really amazing voices um but the, the music business has changed so much and I, I can't really say there's any artist right now that is in in the charts that I feel like, well, that's, that's someone on my list. But a lot of it is not even really my thing so much anymore. Um, but there are still a couple of people like um, I, I recently discovered about a year ago, uh, John Fulbright He's an artist from uh, Oklahoma. And he is an amazing piano player, singer, songwriter. Um, not to say he needs any of my songs, but that's an artist I would love to write a song for or collaborate with as a producer more. Um, and yeah, I, I still write music for uh, solo artists. So someone like a Maxwell recording one of my songs would be phenomenal. Just to know that whatever you do, like a voice like that would, would sing your song. I, that would be amazing. That's still on my uh, on my bucket list. Yeah, I mean, you've definitely got some artists today that are still. I'd say I'd say they're pretty good, like Adele or Bruno Mars. Uh, oh yeah, they come to yeah. mind. I mean, gosh, man, talk about powerhouse vocals, and just Ooh, this, yeah, this, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sorry yeah. about that. I I, I forgot. I, I was just thinking about last year's. Um, uh, Grammys and the artist who won a Grammy there with stuff where I'm like, I, oh, yeah. I don't connect with this. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. really hard for me to to mention an artist. But yeah, absolutely. Bruno Mars, Adele, yeah. They're, yeah, they're definitely. Cool. Yeah. 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 So we'll kind of go ahead and segue into our next selection here. This is a song called The Princess of Eureka Springs. I got to hear the song earlier. It sounds really good. And the melodies just kind of when I heard it, it was just, it reminded me of Billy Joel's Piano Man. Was that intended? Was that supposed to be like? Um, it, it, I think it was, when I wrote the song, um, 
it's a, it's a story. I, I came to Eureka Springs. I, I lived in LA. I met my wife in Northern California. And um, she is from Sepulpa, Oklahoma, and lived in Eureka Springs. And um, I got to Eureka Springs and um, saw this beautiful little quirky town. And I decided to write a tribute song to my wife and to this quirky little town. Um, and while I was writing it, I just got that like nostalgic feel of like a shuffle feel, like a 12, eight beat. And yeah, definitely that sort of, I, I played in a little bar there called Missy's white rabbit. And that was sort of like, I, I really felt like, oh, this, this could be the piano man. This could be the scene for the piano man, for that song. Yeah. So that sort of naturally came out. And I didn't even really realize it until the song was done and people started saying like, I would have a gig somewhere and I would play that song. And then people say like, oh, can you also play Billy Joel, like the piano man? I was like, no, I'm not gonna play that song. Cause first of all, Billy Joel does a way better job than I would ever do. And like the song that I just played is already kind of like that. So yeah, no, I'm not gonna play the piano man anymore after this song. Um, but yeah, I consider that a big compliment actually cause oh, Billy cool. Joel is uh, one of my favorite songwriters. Yeah. Yeah, well, definitely is a great song, and we're going to play it right now. This is the Princess of Eureka Springs right here on The Piano Men. And we're back on The Piano Men with Stanley Carr talking with pianist and musician Michael Waters about his career in the music business. We're going to right now take a few moments and I'm just going to throw out some names of some people you've worked with. And uh, if you can, just give me a little anecdote about them. What was it like to work with them, be around them? Uh, we're going to start with Jennifer Holiday. Jennifer Holiday, I, I never worked with her personally, but um, since I worked with Nona Hendrix, and uh, Nona Hendrix had this child prodigy uh, gospel singer, Najia, uh, signed to her label. And at the time, uh, this was around, um, I guess, I don't even know what year that was, 2001, 9 11. When did that happen? I only know the date. Yeah, it, was, nothing it, was, it, was, it was 2001. 2001. Um, at the time, we had a buddy who was right in the air flying from New York to Amsterdam when that happened. And um, we were watching the news and we got inspired to write a song. And uh, it's a song Through the Storm. And uh, as soon as he landed in Amsterdam, they didn't tell anybody, they didn't tell any passengers who were up in the air at the time what happened, of course, because they didn't want to uh, cause any anxiety or panic. Um, so as soon as he landed, he saw the news and he was like, holy ass, what just happened? He came to the studio and we decided to record this song Through the Storm as a tribute. Um, and... A year or two years later, Nona Hendrix heard that song and she was like, I really want to record this with my artist, Najia, and it's going to be a duet with Jennifer Holiday. And um, so that was my connection with Jennifer Holiday. And I think they did an amazing job on that. I, I believe it was produced by Eve Nelson, who has produced Chaka Khan as well. Mm -hmm. So that was like a couple of names on my list. I was like, well, check the box. That's amazing to... And that's one of those uh, examples of when you write a song and then it goes to the next level and some artists like that start singing your song and you go like, okay, I could not have imagined that. Yeah, I mean, definitely a next level uh, career highlight. Um, Lisa Simone. Uh, Lisa Simone. So we, um, uh, I worked with an artist that toured on a local tour and it was called the daughters of soul and it was a couple of daughters of famous artists um, it was shaka khan's daughter indira khan um it was uh, lala hathaway donnie hathaway's daughter uh it was leah mccray george and gwen mccray's daughter um and they were touring in europe and uh through this tour um lisa simone was also a part of the tour being the daughter of nina simone and we had given a, a little demo CD of some of our tracks to her manager and husband, uh, Rob Kelly. And about half a year later, he calls us and he's like, guys, like my wife just walked out of the shower and being Lisa. And she was like, what are you listening to? This is awesome. And he was like, well, that's the guys from Amsterdam. And, uh, 
And so she was about to record a uh, tribute album of her mother's work of Nina Simone's show tunes uh, or big band arrangements produced by Bob Belden. And they were stuck on one song, um, the song Black is the Color of My True Love's Hair, which is originally an Irish folk song. But because Nina Simone had recorded it, it became kind of an anthem for African-Americans. Hmm. And so they couldn't drop that song off the album like they had recorded it uh, with a, a big band. And Bob Belden was the producer and like, but it just, it missed something. So I remember they, they played the song for me and I was sitting in this chair and like looking at this massive console that you, <laughs> you needed a bicycle to ride around. It was so big and they had massive speakers in the wall. And I'm listening to this recording. And I'm thinking to myself, this is not good. This is like something is missing. And the song is done and I turn around in my chair and I'm looking at all these faces like Lisa's there and her husband and their manager and like the label owner and everybody is like in the studio looking at me like, and what do you think? And I'm thinking to myself like, nah, well, you don't really need my opinion, right? Like, who am I? And they're like, no, we really, we really want to know what you think. We flew you in for this. Like, just tell us what you think. And I see my business partner looking in the corner of my eye, I see him like saying like, no. <laughs> and I go like, well, I think it sucks. And they were like, what? And the manager walks up to me and he's like, we knew it. You're the guy for the job. We booked the studio and like you got like eight hours to fix this. I'm like, what? I didn't expect that one. And um, so they basically gave us carte blanche to like, whatever you guys want to do, fix this production. It needs to be on the album. We can't drop this. And um, so like, there was just no doubt in my mind. I was just like, okay, let's just go. And uh, so we sampled the beat that they had and it sounded like all the horns were like playing something else. There was just no cohesive sound to it. So we started fixing the horn parts to make sure everything was tight. And um, the original song, the way she played it, um, had like this beautiful rubato piano, piano intro. And I was like, so why, where's the piano intro? And they were like, well, we, we didn't record this. And I was like, well, it, but it's so iconic for the song. You, we need this. Um, so they were like, well, we got a grand piano. And I was like, well, mic up the grand piano. And I guess they were so used to producers bringing in like musicians. So they were like, who should we call to play the piano? I'm like, well, I guess that would be me. I'll just play that part. Um, so I started playing that piano part and Lisa was there with a daughter and she was sitting in the corner of the studio. And afterwards she said like, this was like, my mom was coming through you. Like this was, you were playing her. She said like, I've worked with a lot of people and no one has ever been able to play this part, but this was, my mom was, was here. She was present in the studio. And like, that was a, a beautiful moment as well and uh, we recorded the song we finished it it became an all-nighter we we didn't get out of the studio until the next morning like nine o'clock or something and uh, the cut made the album and it got uh, a noteworthy uh, mention in uh, oprah wins oprah winfrey's O magazine and i was like well hey check that off the <laughs> check yeah. that off the list that was awesome yeah you got some recognition there that's that's that had yeah. to make you feel real good Absolutely. Yeah. Those, those are the beautiful moments where you, you kind of step in and like everything, it just leads you to that moment. So like, just go do it. The universe was ready and jumped in and did it. Yeah. And, and it led to working on her um, album afterwards. Like a year later, we got flown back into the studio to work on her album. And uh, we wrote some beautiful tunes for that. Not that un unfortunately that album got dropped because the label dropped her as an artist at the time. Um, but we recorded some really beautiful songs. And one of those songs is uh, Child of the Moon that I wrote. And it was almost like I was channeling Nina Simone with a message for her daughter, Lisa. And when we recorded this song, first I recorded it with her. It was like such a beautiful, profound message that came through. And uh, because the song was never released by Lisa, I recorded it myself again. And I'm now just playing that in every bar I can play it because it's just a beautiful song. It's just yeah. a gift. One of those gifts that you get in life. 
Music is all about feeling, brings just all kinds of emotions. What about Mo Pleasure? What was it like to work with him? Oh, he's a he's a phenomenon <laughs> uh, in his own right. Um, Mo is an amazing piano player. He played keys for I I can't even name all the artists he worked with. He played uh, for one with Michael Jackson. Uh, he was going to be part of the This Is It tour. He was stationed in London at the time. Um, he played with Earth, Wind & Fire. He played keyboards for Earth, Wind & Fire. He played with Janet Jackson. Um, he also plays amazingly bass. Um, and he's just like a phenomenal artist. And when I met Mo, uh, I met him in the studio in Amsterdam and we jammed a little bit. And at the time I wrote a song called Unspoken Rule um, for an artist I work with. And um, later when I recorded that, I asked Mo to play bass on it. And he was like, yeah, sure, buddy, Let, let's do it. And uh, that was just, it's just phenomenal to work with someone that is so gifted and so talented and who is like, sure, I love your song. Let's do it. That's, yeah, I don't know. That feels amazing. He's played with music royalty. I mean, Michael Jackson, Absolutely. Earth, Wind and Fire. I mean, you can't get any better than that. Exactly. Yeah. No, it was such a pleasure. And and again, like Mo would play something that was phenomenal, and he would ask me like, uh, "What do you think? Is this?" A... And I would be like, "Well, maybe maybe we can do another take." And he would play an even better take. And, uh, yeah, it's just one of those musicians, like yeah. extremely gifted and extremely humble, extremely humble, uh, humble guy. You mentioned earlier uh, at the top of the program at the top of the show you lived in LA now for about five or six years and tell me about what it's been like outside of the music world what's it like for you living in America um it has been a challenge to be uh, to say the least like um, I, I lived in LA for six years and I really felt because even as a European I, I was an immigrant and whatever you do, people always hear your accent. So the first thing is like, oh, you're not from here. You're not one of us. Like, who are you? What do you do? And it always feels like, and, and some of my friends have even acknowledged that. Like, yeah, we always assume that people that have an accent, like, they're probably not as well educated. Or they, because you don't, like, you don't sound like you speak the language or something. And, um, and, and it's always kind of weird. You always feel like an out, outsider. Um, I, I've had some friends in LA that even jokingly say, like, you probably have a way better education than we have, but because you have an accent, we don't even realize that. And, uh, and not to say that it's the case, but it's just, just to tell you that wherever you go, people pick you out is like, not so much because you look different, but you sound different. So there's something off. You're not part of the, of the in crowd or something. Um, and it's been challenging. Yeah, it's been challenging to go through the whole uh, uh, the process of the green card situation, trying to be uh, a legal legal alien uh, in this country. Yeah, there's a lot of hoops to jump through. That all the things that I never have to deal with in the Netherlands. You know, if I need something, I just go to the local town hall or whatever. I can get whatever I need, and it's it's just very different to be uh, a non-citizen in the United States. But it seems like you've enjoyed it, though. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's been a, it's been a great adventure. So that's sort of the, the business side, the legal side of it, like all the, the hoops you got to jump through in order to get a car and get insurance and all this thing, like all the paperwork that you don't even realize you have to go through. Um, but at the same time, uh, the United States is the land of opportunity. Like, and it still is like, it's the golden dream. And I've, I've met a lot of um, uh, people from all over the world coming to LA specifically to um, to pursue that dream, whether it's in the music business or in the film industry, it always felt like LA was sort of the Olympic village of everything, of uh, the modeling the modeling world, uh, modeling world happens in LA. So you see the most beautiful people from all over the world live in LA. The music industry, the best musicians and writers from all over the world come to LA. Um, the film industry, all the actors, writers, producers, filmmakers. So it's like a giant, uh, yeah, Olympic village of like talent, basically. And it was, it's amazing to be part of that. Um, it's also a rat race. It never stops. Like every day you're like get, trying to get the new phone call where, you know, you get the, the new break on whatever project you want to do. 
Um, so at some point after six years, I also felt a little depleted. I was like, let me take a step back and, and move to, uh, I moved, I first moved back to Amsterdam and then I kind of, I still miss the state. So I was like, I can live in rural um, United States, Arkansas, beautiful environment. I live in the Ozarks. It's gorgeous out there. The woods, the bluffs, the water. Um, and just take a step back from all the craziness and, um, uh, and yeah, I mean, but there's still a lot of opportunity to play and to work with people, a uh, ton of talent out here. And uh, yeah, it's it's been an amazing journey so far. Yeah, it seems like it has. Well, before we wrap things up, do you uh, have any advice for anybody that's listening that wants to get into the music business? I know, you, you know, like we've talked about, it's definitely changed over the years. Um. Yeah, I think I think the most important thing is to be creative and be authentic to yourself so whatever you do even if people absolutely hate what you do if you believe that that's the thing you're supposed to do and if you feel i really believe in in uh, channel writing like whatever comes through don't judge it just let it come through you whatever you want to call that when you want to call that the universe or god or allah or whatever your belief system is or just channeled higher powers or the seized musicians that help you out with ideas, just take it down, write the song and be very authentic to yourself and just believe in what you do. Um, it's good to, um, to uh, own your craft and to work on your skills as a musician. Like if you want to be a piano player, study some piano and then all the channeling and the writing will also become easier because the more tools you have to create that song, the easier it will be. And just really be authentic. Don't go for TikTok fame. Don't go for, I really don't like to play covers myself because I feel like the original is so good. I should not touch any song unless I really improve it. But most of the music I listen to is already so phenomenal that I actually shouldn't play it. Um, but I only do it because I have to play like three hours in a bar. So I have to throw in some covers. But it's so important to be authentic, to write your own stuff and present yourself with the gift that you get. Yeah, definitely. 100% agree with that. Uh, Michael, this has been wonderful getting the, the chance to speak with you. It means a lot to me and to the listeners that are listening to this. Uh, where can people find you on social media? Uh, well, I'm not an extreme social media buff, but they can find me as Michael Bowders. That's with W-O-U-T-E-R-S on Spotify and YouTube um, and uh, Eureka Waters. Um, I release some stuff under my Michael Bowders channel there uh, and on Spotify is Eureka Waters and that will be the next hub to, uh, to find my music. All right, Michael, this has been great. Uh, I just wanna say thank you again and you're more than welcome to come back. Well, thank you so much, uh, Stanley. This is amazing. And uh, well, I hope I, I wasn't rambling too much and. Uh, you can actually make something out of this. And yeah, I hope I'm inspiring for, for young musicians. Just like do what you got to do. Just go for it. Absolutely. Well, we're going to close things out tonight with a song called So Into You from Michael Waters. This is The Piano Men with Stanley Carr. Like us on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash The Piano Men Radio Show. I'll see you next week.